today you are all will be very lucky because you will get lots of knowledge from Professor Sabian. Okay, uh, last but not least, uh, once again, on the behalf of the faculty, I would like to thank you to Professor Sabir, uh, and hopefully in the future, you can physically visit our campus and broadening our cooperation in research and everything we can get uh, to do together. Thank you very much, Professor. Have a nice teaching. Thank you. Back to you, Lukman. Thank you for your warm welcome, Professor Tanio. And if there is another agenda, we let you to continue your agenda. And now we go to the main session. Uh, but let me show you the curriculum vitae of Professor Shabir. Uh, wait a moment. Uh, curriculum vitae from Professor Shabir Shad Abdul PhD. He is from Graduate Institute of Biomedical Informatics, Taipei Medical University. For his educational background, his medical doctor from Russia, from Master of Science from Norway, and Doctor of Philosophy from uh, Taiwan. Uh, in research interest, uh, his research interest uh, is related with artificial intelligence, big data analysis and visualization, long-term care with the wearable technologies, mHealth, personal health record, and so on. And about his international award, he got from Plum Blossom Park by Government of Taiwan, new investigator of Global Health by Global Health Council, 2010, National Young Min University Scholarship, International Scholar Exchange Program by Norwegian Research Council, Quota Partnership, and the Patents. And without further ado, uh, we let Professor Sabir to share the material. The screen is yours, Professor. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, uh, Dean for introduction and thank you, Lukman, for you are all uh, uh, organizing all these things and also Dina for inviting me. So without uh, delaying, let me share my screen. Can you see the screen? Yes, Professor, yes. you can see. Clearly, yeah. Thank you so much. So as I told, thank you once again. So let us get started. So as you see, the talk is about application of artificial intelligence in healthcare. So before going, uh, uh, discussing what is artificial intelligence, let me take back to what are the real problems in healthcare right now. You see, these are the main issues in healthcare. Number one, medical errors. I don't know how many of you are aware, uh, if you are from medical background, you definitely know how many errors the doctors, the nurses are uh, unintentionally is doing. It's not like they want to do, but because of lack of information, because of overburden of information, because of overburden of uh, patients, a less number of uh, human resource, there are so many factors which uh, play a role in making medical errors. It's not like doctors are stupid or nurses are uh, lazy. No, it's not about that. There are so many serious problems which cause medication errors and there are so many types of errors. It can be because of prescription errors. It can be because of distribution errors. It can be because of giving wrong uh, format of drug. Uh, you say IV, they give IM. You say IM intramuscular injection, but the nurse give uh, intravenous. So there are so many type of uh, errors. Uh, therefore, uh, we need to find out a way how we can tackle these errors. That is issue number one. Number two is poor and inconsistent quality because we develop uh, countries, people from developed countries clearly understand what is difference between public setup and corporate hospitals. We know how are uh, periphery health care in the villages and how are the hospitals in cities. There is a lot of difference, inconsistency in the quality. 
Why? Again, because of lack of information, overburden of the patients, uh, constraints in the resource. There are so many another problems. And the third and most important uh, problem is it's everywhere in the world. It's not only for developing countries. This problem is for all population in the world. That is still now we work like generalized medicine. One size fit all predictions and preventions and curations. What this means? We use a single value for all patients. We use a single drug to treat all patients. I mean, if the patients get uh, temperature or fever, we use same drugs for all patients without any uh, having information about the background genetic information, whether this drug, which drug will be more useful for the patient. So they, therefore, now we got enough information. We know what type of patients are getting allergies to what type of uh, uh, drugs. Then we can do personalized medications. So now come back to uh, artificial intelligence. Usually when I start talking about artificial intelligence, I start saying, asking question, what is intelligence? Although there is, we cannot have like discussion, but I want all the students to think back, what is intelligence to begin with? Intelligence is nothing way nothing but the way we think, the way we analyze, the way we make decisions. That is intelligence. Why we say, okay, this student is intelligent? Because that intelligent gives appropriate answers, quick answers, correct answers, and at the right time. Right? So same thing applies. Uh, this is uh, what to say. Artificial intelligence is nothing but making computer to think like a brain, making computer to take various parameters into consideration and make appropriate decision. That is artificial intelligence. Now the question comes, why we need artificial intelligence? You think human brains are not enough to treat the patient? It's not about human brains. Whenever you take human brains or human as resource, then human needs to sleep, human needs to eat, human need to drink, humans have mood. Sometimes you are good mood, sometimes you have bad mood, sometimes you want to work, someone, sometimes you want to relax, but computers, no. You provide electricity, you provide connection, uh, like whatever Wi-Fi you need or internet connection you need, then there is nothing stops it. It keeps on working as the algorithms are planned for and we can multiply software we can copy or we can multiply uh, literally we can use like 100 computers we can use many things but human beings you cannot multiply you cannot clone me at least we are not in this stage of cloning the people and making like 100 shabits and sending to all villages to uh, treat the patients it's not possible but we can make use of technologies. We can make use of uh, computers to provide assistance. One thing I need to remind you people, never artificial intelligence is going to subs, uh, what to say, take away or uh, uh, what to say, replace human beings. It's going to complement, it's going to help uh, people, not to replace people. So let's start with simple things, how we started, because computer didn't come this year, not last year. Computers are from last 40, 60 years, 40, 50 years. And in these 40, 50 years, we are doing all step-by-step -step things. Before we used to do rule-based inferences. That means we made a system and we made a rules. If the patient is like this, if condition is this, then the system should say this. If the situation is this, then the system should say this. So this is called rule base. After that, we came with more complex uh, formulas of probability. Probability is nothing but chances, odds, risk, uh, uh, ratios, odds ratios of what this going to happen. If the patient has diabetes, how much chance he or she has to develop ne nephropathy 
or retinopathy compared to people who don't have diabetes. I'm giving just an example. So in rule based, if you see, if you have a patient with a diabetes, you also check lungs, oh, sorry, uh, kidneys and eyes. In probability model, we already have some numbers. Okay, if the patient has diabetic, he is 10 times high risk of having nephropathy compared to people who don't have diabetes. If the people who is having uh, diabetes are 10 times higher chances of getting retinopathy for the compared to the people who don't have diabetes. That is called probabilistic inference. Then come statistical models. You know very well what are various statistical models uh, which help us like uh, uh, logistic regressions, all those things which we use daily life uh, to um, uh, interfere the probability or what is going to happen. At the same time, we can use some ad hoc scores, APGAR score, GSM score. So we are using many type of scores to easy our clinical interpretation of the patients. Okay, if the patient is unconscious, how we should uh, glaucoma, uh, glaucoma scale is there, that scale is there, APGAR scale is there. This course will help us again to make some sort of decisions. Why I am saying all these things? So far, doctors were making use of all these things for making a decision. But now, with the advancement in computation power, with the advancement in information and communication technology, with the advancements in uh, reach to uh, data, now we are having huge data. We know all the information about the patients if they are using electronic patient records. Then we can make use of this information to machine to learn to make the decisions. Again, there are so many different type of models. It's not, not like just one model is there. It's like neural network is there. Uh, deep neural network is there. Uh, reinforcement studies there. Supervision. There are so many variety of techniques and models to teach computers how to uh, help us to make decisions. And this is like a mainstream machine learning, deep learning. This is exactly how it looks. So we provide, say, this is like an example. We show them like 100 pictures of cars and trucks and say the computer, this is car, this is truck, this is car, this is truck. And we take pictures from various angles, various uh, fronts. And then every time we will teach the computer, this is car, this is truck, this is car, this is truck. Then the computer will remember all the positions of the car, pictures of the car and all the positions of pictures of the truck. Then after that, when you show the picture of car, the computer will say, this is car. When you show a picture of truck, the computer will say, this is truck. So now take back to healthcare. We give them thousands of images of x-rays of our chest. And then say, okay, this is pneumonia. This is tuberculosis. This is cancer. This is pneumonia. This is tuberculosis. This is cancer. And we take of various uh, densities and various positions of the images. Then this is the model how the computer will remember, okay, if I see x-ray chest, I can distinguish between pneumonia, tuberculosis and cancer. So this is how it works. And then uh, for now, you need a radiologist to read the diagnosis, uh, the screen, uh, what to say, film, and tell you the decision. And there are chances that doctor can be tired, he can do some errors, but computers will never do that. And radiologists are very rare. You cannot find radiologists in your village. You have to go to the district hospital to find a radiologist. But if you have computer system, just you upload your image, it gives you the answer. That is exactly why we need artificial intelligence. That is why we need uh, uh, computers uh, to help doctors with uh, machine learning to take making decisions. Now I give 
some examples, then you get exactly what I wanted to say and how we are using artificial intelligence uh, in Taiwan and uh, elsewhere. Actually. You can actually go and Google this one, My Health Bank Taiwan, you get a website. It's very interesting because Taiwan is a unique country and very few countries which have a single database for whole population. Even in Indonesia, you may be having information of the patients, but isolated. Every district or every county has their own information. Same thing applies in India. Most of the uh, states or uh, cities, even village, they don't even have any databases. Everything is on paper still. So the problem with the paper is we cannot do any analytics unless until we make it in one system. But in Taiwan, they have single uh, database for all 23 pop million population of the country including immigrants like us who are living from many years all our information is in that database and what they have is they have all our uh, when we are visiting the hospitals what diagnosis the doctor is giving to us what medications they are using to that therefore they have this from last 25 years it's not like mm, last year they started. They started right in 1995 when they changed their insurance systems into single payer system. They told, okay, now we are going to pay all healthcare providers, that is doctors, GPs, dental clinics, even Chinese medicine, only when they apply e-claim, electronic claim. That means they should have a system from the system. They should put the name of the doctor, name of the patient, diagnosis of the patient, medications they have used, and even test report uh, tests they are requesting. Because depending on that only, they get payment. And that is called longitudinal data, EHR longitudinal data. And then they use machine learning model and they try to predict cancers in the patients so now whenever you can go to your own health bank it's like your personal health record and you can see how many times you visited doctors what diagnosis they put and what medication they provided you and the national health insurance are making use of this information to predict cancers in the people here uh, I see it's like personalized prevention and cancer prediction, uh, medical history of clinical diagnosis. These things are used. So here, all these are different variables, your age, your gender, what diagnosis you have, what medications you have. Then at the end, uh, they will see, okay, how many chances you have for lung cancer, and CKD, chronic kidney. They are right now, they are checking for these two serious diseases. And this is about me. Okay, gender, male, all female. Okay, this is for, as I told, for hepatocellular carcinoma. So if I am male, I get like two points. And age, all points. If it is 0 to 34, 0 points, 34 to 39, 1 point, 40 to 44, 2 points, like that they have divided. And then they take the values of your lab values, uh, GPT and ALT. Uh, these are like liver enzymes. And then they see ABEAG, uh, uh, what, what you say this, hepatitis B antigens and your age, gender, and at the end you say, okay, you are scoring five to nine. That means you are having one to 10% of uh, chances of getting hepatocellular carcinoma in next five to 10 years risk with the uh, accuracy of 0.84%. It's like very high. But now the question is, if I am getting like this, what I should do? Obviously, I should, if I am consuming alcohol, I should stop alcohol. If I am uh, having fatty food so much, I should stop fatty food. I should do more exercise. Then gradually, this scores will go down and the risk of getting hepatocellular carcinoma will decrease. 
this is how they are motivating population to have healthy lifestyle similar thing uh, we have done in india where we use uh, proposed a model of implementation in india ai based personal health record systems predictive analysis early risk prediction of cancer care and support to cancer for care and support to cancer we are using a wearable device and internet of thing device to collect data from the patients then we do all this modeling and we get back to the patients this is how it works this is like watches which gives heart rate and uh, physical activity your sleep behavior and then we take some subjective information from the phone from uh, apps and all this goes to your phr and the server and that is connected with your hospital's electronic health record and then we do the analytics that we showed with the clinicians this is how it works so scale up existing health records to artificial based phr for risk prediction understand the causes of cancer and develop models to compute risk of contracting cancer develop iot based solutions usually when before the cancer comes the people have some special diseases for example before people get hepatocellular carcinoma that is liver cancer there are high chances they are getting cirrhosis of cancer there are high chance of getting a hepatitis b so all the people who have these diseases we will give more attention see you already have cirrhosis of the liver then you are high risk of developing cancer same thing as i given previous example if the patient has diabetes then we will take care of retinopathy nephropathy neuropathy and we will see they don't get complications and we try to uh, detect at the early stages of the diseases anything detected early will be very useful easily we can cure less pain less money less time but if we get things at the complicated stage basically we cannot help the patient and we need to use so much of medication so much of resources but the value will be very less and the pain will be high also i i want to give some examples uh, from type a medical university uh, where we work with european uh, countries to make this project this is called crowd health it's about uh, making uh, holistic health records and big data analytics for health policy making and personalized health because if you know doctors prefer to use this thing what we call evidence based in order to make an evidence we need to have clinical trials clinical trials are resource consuming and they need lot of human resource they need so much of money they need so much of time and each trial is focused with one question you cannot conduct a clinical trial for three drugs at same time you need to conduct a trial each trial for one drug at a time whereas when we use data analytics we can use so many uh, drugs at the same time we can run big data analytics we can come up with the what is happening with these drugs what is happening patients using these drugs what is happening patients with using this combination of drugs so there were like 20 partners now here tmu is one of them and there were partners from uh, uk from uh, sweden all uh, major uh, these things were there and this is how it looks the basic part is information acquisition because we want to make data driven evidences not research uh, clinical research of course we can take information from anywhere we can take information from clinical resource also research also but uh, for us important is this heterogeneous data source collective knowledge and holistic uh, uh, health record 
So this is how we make, and at the end, we make visualization. And see, big data management, data governance, visualization, evidence-based health policy creation, and evaluation. And there were so many different things uh, in this as component of these projects. Population identification, policy evaluation, policy modeling, data visualization, all those things. And these were the architecture. Definitely, I don't want to go it inside, but uh, to show and schema, it was not so easy. It was very complex stuff. And then we had different use cases, six different use cases. And TMU and Karolinsky Institute, we were focusing on chronic kidney disease. So how we can early detect the complications of people uh, with kidney diseases. And this is how it makes the visualization. So today, several health services, limited data exploitation, in efficient personalization in healthcare provision. That is what I started my talk about. Because we are not still personalizing our healthcare. We are giving generalized medication to everyone. Health record for specific value, inefficient, untargeted and fragmented health policies. But tomorrow we want to do heterogeneous data source integration, integration, holistic health record, data analytics on aggregated data, exploitation of collective knowledge, multi-nodal target policies. So this was this project. Now I will take you to some of my research published on artificial intelligence. So this was one study by uh, published in PLUS ONE using machine learning models to predict initiation of renal replacement therapy. Renal replacement therapy is nothing but hemodialysis uh, or uh, cat, uh, uh, what to say, can uh, kidney transplantation. But mostly we use hemodialysis. So here was the study. Again, we use National Health Insurance Research Database from Taiwan, and we got so many patients. Definitely, uh, I will be sharing these slides. The people who are interested can go and learn the details of this study. And then what we came to know is that the early we start hemodialysis, the, the longer the patient will be uh, having a good time. Uh, he don't go into end-stage renal disease. End stage renal disease means uh, there they need to transplant kidney. So this was the details of the study. So we used 10 different algorithms in combinations and uh, we did balance, imbalance, uh, you see, future selections. Uh, we did filtering, uh, dimensionally reduction. So we tried various different type of models to make all these complications. And these are our uh, research. What we did is that research of a machine learning al algorithm predicting 12, 6, and 3 months ahead of hemodialysis. So what we were doing is, once the patient gets chronic kidney disease, we used to uh, run our models and see whether the patient go into hemodialysis in next 3 months or next 6 months or next 12 months. Depending on that, we give more attention to the people, to that patient. So this is how it looks. And then uh, we came to know what are the most common futures. So uh, blood chemistry, abnormal blood chemistry was uh, top, septicemia, iron deficiency, anemia. These were the most important uh, the symptoms uh, by which the people are landing up in uh, hemodialysis. So if they have all these things, that means they are going into uh, hemodialysis. So conclusion, use of comorbidities to predict renal replacement therapy in predicting the chance of upcoming renal replacement based on the clinical data, using predictive models and general population with data available can allow for better planning and allocation of resources. And my other paper was on uh, brain cancer 
uh, yeah, sorry, blood cancer, hemo, hemo, uh, hematologic malignancies, blood cancers. So we use simple common blood tests to, pre, uh, to screening of blood cancers. Because blood cancers, we don't have any screening uh, test. So whenever the patient comes for some other purpose, eventually when they uh, conduct blood test, the doctor will know about blood cancer. There is no particular symptoms or particular character by which we can detect blood cancer. Therefore, we wanted to use uh, simple blood uh, counts and see whether we can get this uh, predict uh, blood cancer or not. So this is how uh, we did every time. The first thing after getting raw data is data pre-processing, future extraction, future selection, algorithm uh, selection, and parameter tuning, then makes the model. This is the stages of how artificial intelligence works. And exactly it looks like that. These are the variables and these are the hidden layers. Inside you see these are the hidden layers and at the out is the outlay, output layer. Whether the patient has blood cancer, no. So we use like 128 uh, hidden layer nodes. So these are the details and we had like 10 top parameters like platelet large cell counts, uh, plat, uh, platelet crit, optical impedance. These were the very important futures by which we our model was able to detect blood cancer. The, this is the FODL model. Conclusion, ability to predict uh, blood cancers and uh, non-malignancies with accuracy of 82% and 93%. Uh, outstanding performance result on ANN model and a diagnostic ability of artificial neural network achieved high accuracy prediction recall and AOC compared to other models. And my third paper was using artificial based prediction for clinical events again hemodialysis patients using non-contact sensors. Here we use non-contact sensors. That means we don't need to wear, we don't need to touch the body. We keep under the bed of the people when they come for hemodialysis because the people who undergo hemodialysis are high risk of getting complications. They are very much vulnerable. So we wanted to see whether a given patient is vulnerable to get some clinical event or not. Here, clinical event means getting admission or getting some complications. This is the device. This is the screen which will be kept in next to bed of the patient. This is a heart rate. This is breathing rate. And this is mobility, how much the patient is restless. And we wanted to see clinical events means sudden death, emergency visit, muscle spasm, inpatient admission, emergency visit and inpatient, and no event. So for no event means patient is not having event. So we want to see whether the people goes into first six groups or our last group. And again, this is the uh, all procedures, how we did uh, this thing. And this is our model. Definitely, uh, we don't need to go in the depth. It doesn't make any sense. But you need to understand how AI can be useful for what different purposes and how we are solving problems. That is the take home message for you from this talk. See, uh, we use like uh, AOROC 90% with 96 mean prediction and recall and use of non-contact sensors in clinical setting, uh, settings to monitor vital parameters of patients, development of early warning solutions using artificial intelligence for predicting of clinical event, assist healthcare professionals in taking a decision and designing better care plans for patients by early detecting ch changes to vital parameters. And the another paper was about smoking free brain. There we use 
uh, eye change, eye change, behavioral uh, change model to provide some sort of messages. So this was our project called Smoke Free Brain, where we help people motivate them to quit smoking. And if you see, this is the dashboard. This shows from how many days you are not smoking, how many cigars you have not smoked in these eight days, how much money you saved by not smoking these 50 cigarettes, and how much of life you get back. And here you see uh, messages we send once or twice a week messages and uh, see whether how much they like the message. And the beauty of these messages are we only talk positive things. We never say if you smoke, you get disease. If you smoke, you uh, get, you are going to die. People know already and they are not interested to know that. But we say opposite. If you don't smoke, what is going to happen with you? If you don't smoke, we also take with whom they are living, about their uh, environment, whether they have pets, whether they have children in their home, whether they have elderly people in their home, whether they have pregnant uh, themselves or they have some pregnant in their home. Then we make messages using this information. We say, okay, see, nine days you have not smoking. See, your uh, wife is pregnant. Your child will be so much healthy if you continue not smoking. Something like that. Then the question comes, where we are using AI? We are using AI to see the time the users are checking the message, what type of messages they are interested in and we have like 800 to 900 messages we need to take one out of that which suits the patients or user so much so we cannot send them uh, eat healthy food take more vegetables go for running that doesn't work we should know what they are doing then we should say what they should do next So this is how, how all this motivation message, uh, recommender system, this is what I am saying. See, these were all messages and we do suitable message for user A. So out of this, again, we do filter, we use our AI and then only we send them some uh, uh, targeted or uh, uh, yeah, tailored information. So this is how it works. So I don't go in depth, but you see here we know he's a male patient. He's 45 years. He used to uh, smoke 20 cigarettes per day. Already five weeks ago, from five weeks, he's not, not smoking. Then we keep him more motivated. So implementation and development process of health recommendation system using the I change behavior here to help people quit smoking, application of AI based algorithm for digital health solutions. So basically, these were the few things which I want to share with you. I will be very happy uh, to discuss with you and to see if you have any questions. I will be more than happy to answer that. So, Let's open uh, floor for discussion. Okay, thank you, Professor Sabir. I will open the question and answer session to the students. Yes. Please uh, open your mic. Or uh, the first question is from me, uh, Professor Please. Sabir. Please. Uh, you know that uh, for developing country and poor country, uh, what about your opinion about the technology gap to the people? who are not ready to use or to, to create or use the technology like this for developing or for very good this is very interesting question so everything depend upon the use case to whom you are targeting and for what right mm. so here in my cases we had different set of population in first study uh, in cloud health, we had uh, people, normal people who are using simple mobile phone, that's all. And in second case, I had people with cancers. 
in third case i had people elderly people in fourth case uh, people with uh, chronic kidney disease so every time you don't need people to use technology no it is you who are going to use technology or not as a doctor or healthcare provider so in my last study i am sending messages so you think people don't even know to use mobile phone of course no people know how to use phones people know they are chatting they are doing a lot of different works so we should use minimal possible intervention meaning we sh should not make people to click 100 buttons do something more but we should use them to use as simple as possible for example i have wearable device this is my watch they just use watch watch will do rest of the work so they don't need to go and click anything only they need to wear it gives me heart rate it gives physical activity it gives heart rate variability so many other things therefore my short answer is target the population and make minimum intervention to be done meaning they should not go and click they should not go and log anywhere minimum possible things then things will go yeah. okay but sometimes we know that uh, the application needs more steps so to click and then to the next step to further step so this application like not user friendly sometimes sometimes exactly that depend on us how you are making your system so you know the problem you know if you keep 10 clicks people are not going to click it <laughs> so make it user friendly yeah. make it as simple as possible as i told basically they should not even log one time also that is the best scenario but if you need one time then you need to make it like that so that is the trade off that is the trade off so uh, the simple you make the simple uh, uh, what to say user will be there and so many people will use the complex system you make very little people will use for little uh, time again time also is there because if you use some complex systems the dropouts will be so many people will use for one day two day and then they will run away but if it is simple then they can use for long long days uh, so it is possible is it possible that uh, if we we create the application and then we upgrade that application to the be uh, to easier and easier obviously that all depend upon again as i told you it depend upon what is your research question what is your target population these are the two important things without knowing those two things we cannot talk about uh, how we can make simple system how we can make uh, user friendly because we don't even know what we are making right so if we get concrete example okay cancer patient or elderly patients we are targeting this then what should be done then we can come up with the best ideas how we can satisfy these people okay next question is from the chat from dr tito from tmu uh, dear professor sabir i really enjoy your presentation could you share uh yeah, sorry sorry could you share your inspiring stories while you are learning ai with its logarithm and modeling and also how long you until you master them thank you it, okay obviously it depends from person to person again this is like learning process and each day each day i am saying new things are evolving so i cannot say i am master of everything no every day i need to learn what's happening new again i should go back to my problem what target what is my research question for example if i am targeting same thing chronic kidney patients if i want to monitor and i want to do the predictions so what new things i need to learn what are the new informations i am going to get so it's lifelong process honestly speaking it's not like you learn for six months or one year everything will be perfect no it's not going to happen 
this is lifelong process by the time you learn and you master something something new will be coming so you need to keep yourself updated okay 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 next question from uh, my students uh, from putri royan from smart city university uh, firstly i would like to appreciate how you convey such impressive and interesting subject secondly i would like to ask the question ai is made by human and of course there is no such a perfect tools what if there is unfortunately a mistake or a failure during uh, diagnosing the symptom thank you very good question very good question the good thing about ai is before we use we know what is the accuracy of the system right so we know this system can say 80% times true 20% time false but human beings you cannot say for any human beings how much percent i can say true or how much times i can do error right mm. therefore once you make the models you can train if you are not satisfied you say no 80% is not in good enough for me you can add more data you can do more fine tuning and you can improve the accuracy but one thing once the system get some amount of accuracy say 95 98 or 85 uh, then you should make sure always it's going to do that system cannot make wrong for example you take your calculator it doesn't matter how many uh, times you press your calculator will not give you wrong numbers wrong sums wrong calculation because it's all algorithm it is nothing to do like human beings human being can do errors but computers cannot that is the good thing and we know how much accurate is a given system so if you are not satisfied don't use it so very simple so we know each accuracy specificity sensitivity of a model depending on that if you go with that you know okay this is the model this is the system it works everywhere it's not only in artificial intelligence for example now it's covid period so there are so many covid tests available and uh, how much is accuracy 80% 85% 90% for example that means 10 times the test is doing error we know that yeah we know that it's not like no system no test is 100% so given that in mind we should go ahead maybe we should repeat if that is the condition then you will be uh, uh, overcoming that problem yeah and uh, i will share about the experience in indonesia uh, indonesian mm -hmm. people start uh, using like mobile application like health technology platform to simplify the access between patient and uh patient and doctor but sometimes uh we know that there is a weakness there is no you know there is no uh touching between doctor and and the patient there is no heart heart like heart touching like something something like this what about your opinion <laughs> the opinion actually uh, this is also very interesting thing in last two years things have changed before patients used to say exactly we want to touch we want doctor touch but now patients are saying no i don't want any touch from doctor they don't even want to go to hospital because they have high risk of getting covid if they go to hospital therefore they are preferring uh, telemedicine yeah tele care so things have changed totally in these two years and what we were trying to convey patients in last 20 years they understood in last one year so now there is no more such concern like we want touch if you touch then covid will touch you very simple yeah next question is from uh, anisa from my student anisa sifa uh, i would like to ask the question professor is a a a ai safe to use in diagnosing patient who have complication from the disease how do we ensure the diagnostic quality of this ai that we use in 
complication condition yeah, this is this is what i was talking all my lecture actually so first of all to make any ai model you need to get data first yeah data means you need to know all the variables and you need to know the answer whether the patient got this disease or not those things you are going to teach your computer if you have this 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 is the answer if you have this 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 is the answer then you are testing it by a new data set where you don't give the answer you only show this patient has this 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 variables but you don't say whether they have a disease or not now you ask computer to answer that if they answer then we see their sensitivity specificity and accuracy you need to know this three, three things what this three means then you can make your system then you can decide whether i should use this system or not okay uh, next question is from uh, wait uh, from mamlu atul uh, hello professor sabir i would like to ask regarding covid 19 is there any artificial intelligence implemented in taiwan to help deal with covid 19 and how it works yes 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 you need to read a paper actually uh, big data analytics taiwan support response to covid this was published last year uh, definitely taiwan is using uh, big data analytics to deal with covid patients mm. because the real point or near pain point is tracking the patients yeah and tracing the patient and treating the patient okay in order to do this now they are using a qr code to all shops to all hospitals to all restaurants wherever you go even 7-eleven you go there is one qr code then you go and uh, take qr by this QR, you are sending SMS from your phone to one database. Mm -hmm. Imagine you went to 10 different shops in one day. The database knows how many shops you went on that day. And not only you, thousands of other people are also going there. Right? Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, whenever someone gets COVID positive today, then they will take all my data from last 14 days and they send messages to all these people who have visited those shops to isolate themselves and check if they have any symptoms, go for isolation. So uh, Taiwan is really, really using and that is the reason why after, although we had a peak in last one month, but after doing all these things, we have only 500 deaths and uh, around 15,000 cases from last year, right. from last year. Actually, till last month, we had only 1,000 cases and only nine deaths, nine. But last 50, 45 days, things went a little bit bad. And now we are at home, but uh, they are doing very good job. They are using a lot of AI, a lot of technology, a lot of information communication technology. Uh, professor, would you please repeat the name of the publication uh, or the name? Yes, of the yes, yes. One minute. Uh, I will stop sharing and I will. Uh, one minute. Stop share. I stop sharing, right? Yeah. Stop. Give me one second. This was a JAMA paper, actually. Oh. Yes. Yeah, Dina has shared in the chat menu. I think it is the you same. Yes, exactly. This paper. I want you guys to read this, although it was published last year, but still it is very useful. Okay. 
Oke, okay, uh, next question, Professor. Uh, it is interesting, but you have explained in the beginning of the, your your lecture. Uh, from Octavia, will artificial intelligence replace humans? Uh, artificial intelligence will not replace humans, but it will replace uh, humans who don't use artificial intelligence. Yeah. <laughs> Meaning the doctors don't to you don't use artificial intelligence will be outdated. Only the doctors who use artificial intelligence will be working in the future. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the next question uh, from Imro Atun. Hello, Dr. Shabir. Uh, I would like to ask if AI can help diagnose disease more precisely and quickly. Should all types of disease have AI technology to diagnose this disease? Again, AI has no specific diseases, understand? AI is nothing but your essence of your data. What data you provide, that type of diagnosis you can train. So it's not like AI can do cancer, AI cannot do diabetic, AI cannot do ca what to say hypertension. No, AI can do anything because AI is not used only in healthcare for your kind information. AI is also used in many other fields, in businesses, in uh, commerce, in so many things because. Now, uh, I am 100% sure you guys see Netflix, right? Yeah. So there are like recommendations for you. How these recommendations comes for you? Because it depends upon what type of movies you are watching so far. By using that, the system will use AI to see, okay, this guy like, for example, if you like Indian movies, Mm. Salman Khan movies. <laughs> if you watch all Salman Khan movies, then whenever there is Salman Khan movie, they say, okay, this is the movie you want to watch maybe. Then of course you want to watch. And if you want to watch some other like Jackie Chan movie, then whenever there is Jackie Chan movie, they will show you this is Jackie Chan movie. So AI is used everywhere. It has not disease specific. So you cannot ask like whether the AI can diagnose this disease or not. No, it all depends upon what type of data you have to train your model yeah yeah because there is no question more from students uh would you please share to the students uh who want or interest to research in the technology in healthcare professor pattern can you repeat the question uh, would you please one, to share one question from sylvie anti oh, oh sorry sorry from Silvianti, wait, wait. From Silvianti, oh yes. Uh, from Silvianti, my students, uh, is there a possible negative impact on the use of AI in the health sector, Professor? See, again, uh, if I ask, is there any negative impact of internet? Yeah. So obviously, it totally depend upon how you are using anything anything it's not only about ai or internet even you take small knife at home knife you know right we cut the things in kitchen every time so the good thing is we want it to for that purpose but if you use that for bad purpose then that's you are bad not ai is bad right so of course, it all depends upon how you are using, with what purpose, with what intention. It has technology, say technology. If there is internet, see, we are using for communication. But some people can use only for uh, playing games and losing a lot of money. Yeah. It doesn't mean uh, internet is bad. Yeah. It all depends upon how you are using it. Yeah. Okay, uh, last but not least, uh, would you please to share with the students about the advice or message to the students who will interest or... Definitely, I will be more than happy and I would like them to contact me if they have some ideas, uh, both in terms of projects or in terms of publications. Okay. I think there is one more. Okay, <laughs> from Mylina, from Rizki Marina. Uh, 
AI is very influential in diagnosis of disease. How to find out the effectiveness of using AI technology in Taiwan? Has there ever been an error when using it? Always there will be. As I told you, AI cannot be 100% correct, nor human beings. The good thing about AI is we know the number. Mm -hmm. It's error. It gives error for 5%. It gives error for 10%. But human beings, we cannot know. That is the beauty of AI. And there are so many papers. You can just go and uh, Google uh, in PubMed and see AI papers. Uh, every paper, every model has different accuracies, different AORVOCs, AURVOCs. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, students, is there any question from you, the professor? Or you can open your mic? Yeah, or just send me email. Okay. Professor, open the email. Please uh, share the research interest you with the professor. I think there is no more question. Finally, we come to the end of session. I would like to say thanks again to Professor Sabir for the interesting lecture. But before we close, uh, please open the camera and we will take a picture together. Please to the students, open the, your camera. I will take a picture from my device. Uh, from screen number one, please open your camera. Uh, yeah, if the time to take picture, you will open the camera. Please open your camera. Wait, wait. Okay, please smile and I will take picture. One, two, three. Now wait. So screen number two. Please open your camera. Okay, number three, number four. Okay, I think it is enough, Professor Sabir. Let uh we say to thank you again to you for your interesting lecture here and to, to dina uh, thank you for your help to bridge with the uh, professor sabir and let's give one again bigger round of applause for our speaker thank you for your uh, we are very happy for having you and hopefully the lecture will be beneficial for everybody and thank you for your attention I close with Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. And to the students, uh, it is the link to your certificate issuance. Please click this link, uh, s.id and uh, slash ph4 UNES. Please write your email address correctly and the e certificate will be sent to your email address. The link is active for only 60 minutes. And we use artificial intelligence directly send your certificate. <laughs> Simple artificial intelligence, uh, not creating in the file draw, and then we design the name and send your send the certificate to your email. It is uh, uh, automatically sent to your email. Please be sure to write your email address correctly. Sometimes students from UNES write the email address, for example, like at uh, students without S, student only. Yeah, it is wrong email. Thank you for your kind attention. You can leave the room. Terima kasih, Dek Lukman. Terima kasih. Sama-sama, Bu Dina. Yeah.